Welcome to the Who's Counting podcast with Cleta Mitchell, the podcast about America's elections. Hello, I'm Cleta Mitchell. Welcome to this episode of Who's Counting. This is a podcast about all things elections, how elections are supposed to be run, how sometimes they're not run the way they're supposed to be, and what we as citizens can do about it. And we're honored today to have with us the Honorable Ken Cuccinelli from the Great Commonwealth of Virginia. Ken is a former state legislator. He's a former attorney general of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And he's a former acting deputy secretary of the Department of Homeland Security under President Trump. Plus, he has been a leader in conservative battles for a very long time. So, Ken, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. My pleasure. I appreciate you focusing on this issue. Uh, Ken, uh, tell everybody about your role. Uh, I want to go back and talk about uh, some of your background, but um, you're the chairman of the Election Transparency Initiative. Is that correct? That's right. And the Election Transparency Initiative is a joint venture of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life on one hand and American Principles Project on the other. Um, Obviously, biggest pro-life organization out there and American Principles Project um, covers really all the other social conservative pro-family issues. They're sort of brother and sister organizations. And we were formed after the 2020 election because of the demands of their members and the recognition that if they're going to keep winning the hearts and minds of Americans, we need to be playing on a fair playing field. And that's the elections. So that's, that's where the election transparency initiative came from. Michael Bars is our executive director, very capable, and um, really we've had a lot of success the last couple of years. Uh, Everything hasn't been success, but there have been a lot of successes. Well, tell us, um, before we talk about some of the specific projects, I'm very intrigued by and really, um, I'm very supportive of the notion of election transparency. Talk to us about how you came up with that as the name. And what what would you tell everybody about why it is so important to have transparency in elections? What does that mean? So our view at ETI of the gold standard is citizens being able to see literally every part of the election from start to finish with the sole exception of how voters mark their ballots. So they can trace everything. So everything is auditable. So those performing these tasks can be measured on the quality of their performance. Um, And so ultimately, and this is the the platinum standard, is so that the losing side can see that they lost in a fair game without, without serious question. And look, I'm a lawyer, you're a lawyer. The analogy I use all the time is going into court. Good judges make even losing parties feel like they were at least treated fairly. Well, that I think that's a really important principle. And I think that everybody needs to understand we are not about manipulating the outcome. It's not Um, our job to run the campaigns. It's not our job to get people elected. But we have to restore some semblance of fairness and integrity to the process so that, as you say, that's a really good point, Ken, so that even the losing side says, we gave it our best, we did our best, the outcome is the outcome, the voters have spoken. I don't think people feel that way about 2020. And frankly, in some places in 2022, I don't think people feel like the voters have spoken. Well, let's let's use a counterexample. In both years, 2020 and 2022, Florida, the largest swing state in the country by a fair margin, um, had their votes counted on election night, you know, by on on the the most recent year by about eight o'clock. I mean, okay. they were nearly done counting. And now, look, I, I don't want to impose impatience on an already impatient country, the United States. But the reason they were able to do that is because of the process steps they took beforehand that both sides of every election could see. And what happened? In 2020, relatively close in Florida, but neither side, winning or losing, had any serious complaints. Same again in 2022. Now, it wasn't close in 2022, but the system had been improved, continued to improve. And I use Florida as an example, not just for the last two years, 
but you and I are both just barely old enough to remember Bush v. Gore right. in 2000. And, and, and let's face it, Florida was humiliated on the world stage with the low quality, just quality, forget cheating, just the low quality of the execution of their elections. And what people learned when everyone at once focused on just one state is they've been performing this badly for a while and no one had paid enough attention or cared enough to try to fix it. To the Republicans' credit and Jeb Bush's credit coming out of 2000, they spent years legislating cleanups because elections aren't simple. They are complicated in the nuts and bolts. It's also kind of boring unless there's some pressure to get it right. And they spent the years of work needed to really improve Florida and make it a national model. It still has work to do, as we saw. I mean, Governor DeSantis is still proposing changes and and improvements to the Florida system. And yet it is certainly among the big states, far and away the best system in the country. Bush v. Gore and the resulting fixes that came after it really goes to show, as Americans, if we set our mind to solving a problem like this, even a touchy, sensitive one with all sorts of partisan, you know, conspiracy theories, we can do it because we've done it. But here's the thing that is so distressing to me, Ken. We all saw what happened in Florida in 2020, in 2000. And yes. fast forward to 2020, and there were significant problems in state after state. And we have learned even more as we have come past uh, 2020. And yet the media and the left, I you know, repeat myself, the Democrats, they, they attack us. They call us election deniers. They tell us we're crazy. They're trying to disbar people like me and others because we followed the law, filed election contests. But we uh, documented the yeah. different problems. And yet there's complete refusal and resistance to even wanting to hear anything. It's just la, 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 nothing wrong. Everything's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> Certainly, that's how the left is playing it. I don't think ordinary Americans are buying that. I mean, just look at a a straightforward subject, the requirement for voter ID. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard for a year, year and a half what racist we were for people having to identify themselves. Though, interestingly, when Vice President Harris was pressed on black entertainment television, she said, well, yeah, you know, people got to be able to tell you who they are. (laughs) But um, That was in June of 2021, in the midst of them screaming Jim Crow about Georgia, even in the face of the Washington Post calling them out as liars for it. And of course, the data that's come out of 21 and 22 out of Georgia has demonstrated that we were right and they were wrong. And yet this two-year attack on things like voter ID hasn't moved the needle with ordinary Americans. They still think it's just basic common sense. And so much of elections run right is just the application of common sense. This isn't liberal, conservative, left, right. The difference between the left and the right is the left wants to muddy up the process because they believe they get an advantage in the mess. And the right wants, consistent with our uh, continually pressing for the rule of law, We want clear, transparent, secure, and reliable elections. Um, I am familiar. I do some work as a lawyer in blockchain space. Blockchain is the technology that underlies Bitcoin. That's what it's most popularly known for. But it can be given ordinary computer-type applications. And I'm familiar with some well-meaning folks on the left who are technologists who developed a blockchain voting solution of theirs, and they brought it to some of their political lefty friends, and they were taken aback to learn that their political lefty friends had no interest in fixing the problems they were trying to fix, and they were astounded by it. But you and I know that every day. The ends justify the means on the left. And as I tell people, take in Virginia, where we have a 45-day election, You want to get rid of early voting? 
beat them at early voting. They'll join you in getting rid of early voting because they have no principled connection to any of these methods or tactics other than what they think gets them the most votes. Well, we'll have an opportunity, opportunity to see that in Virginia uh, this fall, I guess. Or actually, it's starting in September because of the 45 days of early voting uh, yes. for the legislators. And, and I guess that's what that's who's up this year in Virginia, right? The legislature. The whole General Assembly, yes. So um, talk about some of the projects that uh, ETI was involved with in 2021 and 2022. Um, you mentioned that some successes. What have been your priorities uh, over the last couple of years? And, and how would you describe those and tell people about what, you, what you're doing? So right out of the gate and the beginning of 2021, we were keenly focused on avoiding a Washington takeover of state elections. Right. For all of the challenges we have out in the states, um, and you, you rattled off some of them in 2020, there are many more. Um, that's still better than D.C. taking this over. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> and, um, and what that came down to effectively was preserving the filibuster. And the filibuster is something that has frustrated people on our side when we wanted to get things passed. But here it was playing its protective role of trying to achieve national consensus before making a major change. The Constitution, and, and look, people who want, you and I may differ on this, but People who watch certainly will. The Constitution um, has left elections with the states, but it has given the federal government strong power to step in in federal elections and um, with the elections clause. And uh, we don't want the federal government doing that. What has the federal government ever stepped into outside of military uh, responsibilities that they've done better than alternatives could have done it? I can't name anything. I and can't um, literally not a thing. And uh, so we don't we don't want them in the elections. We don't want uh, particularly when you've got such a politicized Department of Justice as we have right now. The oh, idea gosh. that they would be the cops for all elections would be truly demoralizing. And I think legitimately call into question um, the, the legitimacy of the handling of, of that situation. So we fought that very hard. We called upon the membership bases of both SBA Pro-Life and American Principles Project. That's about a million committed conservatives that we have regular connection to. We also identified, we did data modeling in the states where this was most contentious with their senators, for example, in West Virginia or Arizona. Mm -hmm. And we found people who may not vote Republican um, or wow. maybe ever, who agree with us on these things. Because again, as I said earlier, as Americans, this is really just a common sense it sort is. of a, 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 a set of issues, if you will. And we found tens of thousands of them in every state we checked. And we helped connect them into the process as well on this issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're Joe Manchin and, and the equivalent of Ken Cuccinelli calls your office, if you, yeah, you, you take the call because he's from West Virginia. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, you know, you're never getting Ken Cuccinelli's vote. But if Joe Swing Voter calls you and, and a thousand other Joe and Jane Swing Voters call you at 90 to one in one oh. direction, those are people you can't win an election without. Now, a lot of senators won't admit that this moves them at all, and that would be a flat-out lie, <laughs> um, and we know it. And, and we specialize in that kind of uh, very personal constituent contact. It isn't me calling the Joe Manchin and, and Kristen Cinemas of the world. It's people from West Virginia. It's people from Arizona who we bring into the process and connect them to. It's very powerful. And we repeated that whole methodology in the states where we tried to help advance good election uh, legislation. And I would look back a few years. You remember the bathroom bills of maybe four years or five years ago? Right. In North Carolina. Gender junk started happening. And 
the Republican North Carolina legislators crumbled like a dry cookie right out of the gap, right out of the, the hatch in the very beginning of the year. And then it was legislature after legislature. They just fell off the issue and they abandoned our pro-family natural law position. Well, we were determined not to let that start happening in the election space. And as you and I have talked about before, there was a lot of national groups and new state and local groups forming in this time. We already had a membership base to operate from. So we really dove in early to try to fill that gap as the election integrity movement really grew itself, very mm-hmm. organic. And Virginia Virginia was a great model. I mean, we call it the Virginia model now, and, and you have done wonders spreading that around the country. But that began with Virginians. It didn't begin with the Election Transparency Initiative or any of the big national conservatives. No, it did not. It began with Virginians who saw the problems and decided, you know what, we're going to fix this ourselves. And they set about doing it by becoming election officials, getting trained, and going inside the elections and truly running them. And within Virginia, of course, as you pointed out this year, an odd year, we have elections every year. Yes. So new election officials can move up the ladder of responsibility much more quickly than they can perhaps in some other states. So, and Virginia is not a blue state, but it's a reaching red state. It, you know, it's a tough one. It's become tough for us to win, but not impossible, as Glenn Youngkin, Winsome Sears, and Jason Miara has showed us in 2021. So, um, you know, that that gives me a lot of hope across the country. Uh, ETI is going to spend a lot of its time and effort in 2023 and into 2024, expanding those training efforts, those recruiting efforts to get people like us who care about honest elections, who don't want to go inside to put their thumb on the scale. They want to go inside to make sure the scale stays balanced and the law is followed. And it's freaking the other side out because they're used to dominating these spaces. And now we've finally shown up to compete and they don't like it. So that's well, well that, you know, it's true because, um, as you pointed out, these people in Virginia, they formed local election integrity task forces in Loudoun County and Fairfax County and Richmond and started meeting and training people to be poll watchers. And uh, what's interesting is, um, I can't remember if it was a Loudoun County or Fairfax County group, but the first time they, a group of the conservatives that had formed the local election integrity task force went to the uh, board, uh, electoral board meeting. There are all these League of Women Voters, or as I fondly call them, the Plague of Women Voters, or, um, you know, and other leftist groups that have people, but in ev- everywhere, they looked over at our people and said, what are you doing here? Right, and then at some point began to FOIA the uh, requ- the FOIA requests that the election integrity task forces had submitted to the local uh, electoral board because uh, to the registrars because they wanted to know what we were doing, what our people were doing, and I just kept saying to everybody, "Look, you have to be polite. Don't don't lose your temper. Um, just." You know, just understand that we you're a foreign object in their ecosphere (laughs) and we have to change that so that they expect that when they go there, you're going to be there. And that's what I wish we could replicate in every locality. Well, and let me drive your point home, Cleta. I can tell you as a former attorney general, people people don't respond. People think about doing bad things or getting sloppy. They don't respond to higher penalties. Mm -hmm. They don't respond to the actual likelihood they will get caught. They respond to their belief in the likelihood that they will get caught. It's not the same thing. So you'll recall last fall when the left was drumming their one of their talking points was, oh, these terrible Republicans are invading election offices and this and that. And you'll recall I told people. We shouldn't, we shouldn't counter this. Let them scream it. Let them worry yes, about it. Yes, they're doing, are. yeah, yes, we are. Own it. They're doing our job for us because if their election officials believe that, guess what? Then 
they will behave. And, well, uh, and I think that, that did work in most in a lot of places. It didn't it work did. in Maricopa County. <laughs> no, I understand, but we're never going to get it everywhere, and we're never going to have perfect elections. What we're looking for is as much improvement as we can get. And things like 2022 reveal what's needed in Maricopa County. Yes, Arizona is an important swing state and so forth, and it's got a Senate election in addition to presidential in 24. But the lessons we learn in Maricopa, we also apply in other places, Mm -hmm. just like we did after the 2020 election. It's why, you know, you, you commented very briefly there earlier on what we learned after the election. It was one thing what was going on then and contests Mm -hmm. after, but in the year and a half now, two years plus since that election, the studying of it has revealed more and more and more. And and we've learned about things that need to be fixed. Zuckerbucks is a classic example. Um, and it was Zuckerbucks wasn't so much bad laws. There were no laws. That's true. You know, um, I believe they violated tax law, but yeah, I mean, you you talk about a tool that is badly suited to really go after the other side, the tax code. Oh, right. That's true. It's, well, I know that fit rest votes, uh, Citizens for Renewing America did file an IRS complaint against Mark Zuckerberg and his wife and their foundation and their conduit foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, right. as well as the C3 organizations that are not supposed to have anything to do with politics. Right. But they spent nearly half a billion dollars driving up Democratic County, ter- Democrat turnout in key cities across uh, and key in battleground states. And they, they changed the outcome of the election. I fully believe that. Oh, yeah, I, I do, too. And in fact, in, in when I was stuck in front of the January 6th grand jury uh, recently, they asked me about, am I aware of anything of fraud, this or that? Or he used the word meddling um, that changed the outcome. And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Zuckerbucks alone did it. And he said, well, was that fraud? I said, you said meddling. <laughs> so, well they they asked me that same thing i had to i have had to endure that as well and they asked me uh, and i said let me just make a simple declarative a declaratory statement this is one declaratory sentence there are more illegal votes that were cast and counted and included in the certified total votes that were cast in violation of the state law uh, and included in the certified total than the margin of difference between President Trump and Joe Biden in Georgia, in Arizona, and in Pennsylvania, and in Wisconsin. I know that for a fact, and that's probably true in some other states as well. If you'd like for me to uh, go through and show you how I know that, I'd be happy to do that. But we know it from the Arizona audit. We know it from the study that was done of Wisconsin. Uh, We know it from uh, work that's been done in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, certainly I know it's uh, it's true in Georgia, but they didn't really have any more questions to ask about that. But I guess they'd like to put us in jail because we say things like that. Yeah, well, they they certainly would. I did not get the sense that that was um, an unbiased search for the truth. (laughs) But I, I also I also used the Georgia example just as you did. And I said, look, I don't know. I don't know how these votes broke out. But you just right. asked your question, and he had framed the question in such a way um, that the the errors were more than the margin of victory, and so it calls into question back mm-hmm. to our ETI platinum standard. Does the loser have confidence that the outcome was the right one? Well, not under those right. circumstances. No, that's true. Well, so what? Um- you know, I was really just thinking, and you and I've talked about this some, but it seems to me that the more rocks I've turned over over the last two years, that transparency really is the battleground in the election offices. Um, and it, and I think that I'm, I begin to realize that more, and I think we have to do a better job of communicating that to our, to, as you say, this organic movement. But I think about every step of the way, they fight us on not wanting to turn over records. I'll give you an example. Just this week, um, I've been working with people in Florida. I've been working with them for a while. But 
under the state law and the federal law, list maintenance records. Those are the records that the election office keeps that shows what they're doing to keep the voter rolls current. Are they sending out the required notices? Are they processing returned right. mail? Are they doing, are they recording deaths and removing people who died? But all of those records, because they keep records of, of the activity um, to maintain the list, and under federal law and state law, those records are open records, available for public inspection, and copying. That's what the state law says in Florida. Well, of course, those laws were passed 30 years ago. Before there were electronic records that be before you could just transmit through some electronic format um, the records. So now what the people in Florida, the volunteers have been told is, OK, Broward County, you can come in and we'll, we'll make PDF copies of the list maintenance logs. And that's like 1.2 million records, probably more pieces of paper than that. PDF copies. And by the way, it'll cost you a uh, half a million dollars for us to do that. Well, that's like having no transparency at all. And so I said, well, maybe you should introduce, add a, an amendment, get a bill introduced that says that they're available electronically to the public at, min at nominal cost. But, and it's just everything we start to work on, we find an, a, a, an effort to say, no, you can't see that. No, you can't look, you can't look at that. It's like the Voting systems, the technology, the voting machines. Right. If the manufacturers would just be open and let people inspect. And I know of multiple situations where a secretary of state asked one of the companies, come in and open up a, a machine and show everybody what's inside. They wouldn't do it. They will not do it. Why is that? Yeah, I back to my gold standard on the machines. The gold standard isn't just... Um, open hardware, it's open code, publish your code so that ordinary voters who care to double check the system can essentially rerun a race and duplicate the code themselves. The problem from the company's standpoint is those proprietary elements are how they separate themselves in the marketplace. They don't want voting machines to become a commodity they want to keep them special and secret as they have up to this point in time. And that is not conducive to transparency or confidence in the outcome. And let, just to zero in on transparency, the value of transparency to our system is the uh, confidence it instills in the outcome um, because everybody behaves better and because mistakes are auditable and fixable. Ken, explain what you mean by open source or open code. I, I'm not a technology person. Sure. Uh, what does that mean? What that means is that it is licensed by the developers for anyone to use. And the natural result of that is anybody can load it on their own machine and run it themselves. The idea in open source coding is that you get this communal effort to develop the code and improve it. Um, the benefit from our perspective is that you can see it and you can test it yourself to see what it does or does not do. I mean, lots of people are concerned that machines get pre-programmed one way or another. I'm going to I'm going to set optical scanning aside for a moment, but if I can't see the programming, it's possible for the programmer to cheat. It's that simple. If I can see the programming, um, they can't cheat and get away with it because I can read what they've written in for the machine to do. Um, now, I'll go to optical scanning just briefly because, and for folks who don't know, before I went to the dark side and went to law school, I was an engineer. So ah. I'm, um, I'm at least comfortable with these technology issues. That doesn't mean I'm an okay. expert. Uh, but the optical scanners are, when you use an optical scanner and you fill in a bubble, the machines are programmed based on the measure of where that bubble is from the two, two edges of the paper. So if it's the first bubble in the upper left corner and it's one inch from each edge, you're obviously near the corner there. And if that bubble's filled in, it's Donald Trump. If the one an inch and a quarter down and an inch from the margin is filled in, it's Joe Biden. And if you get those 
measurements wrong, the optical scan report is going to be wrong. Um, it's also why at ETI, we still consider the paper ballot itself as the gold standard for the official ballot. To we totally object to electronic vote curing. We object to vote curing by anybody other than the voter themselves. No one but the voter themselves. And if the voter screwed it up and it's too late to cure, then the vote doesn't count. And nobody likes to not count votes, despite what the media might say. But you've got to have an adjudicatory system that works the same way for every person. Back to Bush v. Gore, the hanging chads. And you've got these election officials looking at this punched piece of paper mm -hmm. to divine the voters' intent. Are you kidding me? Right. Um, but and they're doing that now. They adjudicate. They I have know. these panels that adjudicate ballots. Yeah, and that to me, that is completely wrong. Well, that interestingly, after the 2020 election, the reason that Karen Fan, the Arizona State Senate president, the reason she thought it was important that they do that audit of the Maricopa County election from, tw from 2020 was because they had gone from a 2% um, rejection adjudication rate to 11% um, of the ballots in 2020 in Maricopa County were rejected by the tabulators and had to be hand adjudicated where literally it is, you know, uh, people sitting there saying, huh, I think that person is voting for, I think they're voting for, do you agree who that person is voting for? And it was 11%. That represented about a quarter of a million ballots. Yeah. And guess what it was this year? After these election officials fought, Maricopa County fought the audit, they said, everything was fine. We don't know what's going on. Why do you want to do this? And they did everything they could to fight the audit instead of saying, yeah, that's a lot. We maybe ought to figure out why what happened. This past November, Maricopa County, the number of adjudicated ballots, the percentage went from 11% to 16%. That's going from 2% in 2018 up to 16% in 2022, where you have other people deciding trying to figure out how people voted. Now, there is something wrong with that. Yeah, and, and you're generous in saying they're trying to figure out how other people voted. The more skeptical yeah. would say they're trying to figure out ways to put the votes where they want them. Well, that I think that's right. Which, so, is why, which is why I, ETI's position is, it's one thing if you have massive ballot curing, but the voter has to cure it, not someone else. Okay, so... So, Ken, here's my question to you. And you and I have talked about this, and I want you to do this. So I'm going to ask you this in front of everybody. So I think that transparency is the most important principle it, because you have to have transparency before you can have accountability. Yeah. So my question to you is, have you published, here are the 10 or 15 principles that must be in every election process so that people can say, okay, here is the gold standard. ETI is, has identified, here's what the gold standard is. And then we could arm citizens with that to be able to go in and say, well, this isn't transparent and this isn't transparent and they don't have number four, they don't have number seven. So we're going to fight for that. Are you yeah, doing so, that? So we have advanced a lot, really general election reform mm -hmm. priorities, not specifically zeroing in on just the transparency pieces. That's just something we started thinking about as a separate legislative push mm -hmm. this, this past season, if you will. And um, now the state legislatures are coming in, but uh, ETI is very small. So we try to put this together. Um, at the same time, we expect to start doing records as people get into um, the Republican and presidential, I'm sorry, Republican and Democrat presidential races, we're going to look back at their election reform records too, and yeah. we're going to let people know what those are. Some people won't have any. And yeah, be because of the, yeah. well, for some of them, um, it may be because of the positions they have and have not held for others. It, that's going to be a more questionable absence, but we'll let them explain that. 
Um, we're going to put all that out in, in one place as they get into these races. So the people who understand and care about elections as a critical uh, element of our constitutional system functioning properly can judge the candidates on it. And, um, uh, and we'll let the voters decide from there. So that's one thing we're doing in this, this coming year plus. And we're also trying to figure out how to accomplish just what you said is zeroing in on what states do offer in the form of transparency, you know, and not really you look to the best states and then you look to the other states and say, well, why don't you do this, this, and this? And, um, and, to, and to let them compete with one another to be the most transparent. So that, that's a path we're just going down now. Um, but um, I appreciate you calling me out on it. No, I'm not calling you out. I'm just, I, I, you're a former attorney general. You're a great lawyer, you're a great constitutional mind. If there's anybody in America who could really uh, set, set up that gold standard that everybody could measure uh, their state's by and their local offices, uh, their local election offices. I think it would be Ken Cuccinelli. I think you're the one. But, um, you know, we talked about Florida, and I just want to come back to one thing, um, because they do a lot of things very well, but I think they would fail a transparency standard in this regard. They don't allow um, citizen observers to watch all of the processing of absentee ballots when they are verifying the identity. Of the, of the voter. And I just think that those are all procedures that ought to be open to the public. Um, absolutely. And I have absolute uh, access to be able yeah, to. And it's, it's funny in it. Florida because they have these, what by the standards of their sister states are very radically open, uh, like FOIA laws, sunshine laws. Right, right. I mean, you, you can't create anything in Florida without it becoming a public record. So right. it is a bit anomalous. Um, where other states allow citizens to see this process as mm -hmm. they should. And, and all parties with an interest should be able to watch. Um, well, and not, and, and, not like not they do it, and then not like they do it in Las Vegas and Clark County, where they it's all done and it's behind a glass and everybody's kind of sitting right, back. Or Detroit, <laughs> you can't see anything. Right, like, or yep, Detroit. Right, or Detroit, where you... Doing where you sit in a basketball arena in the stadium and watch them <laughs> on the floor with tables. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's that? That's yeah. kind of useless, but, um, yes. so, um, I was going to ask you just, um, so if people, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to mention and ask you if people want this, how they could get it. You publish ETI publishes this wonderful, uh, e-newsletter every day, um, that has clipping of news articles. Yeah from all over the country uh, you know, about elections, election reform. And it's really fab. It's a fabulous wealth of information. It's a little discouraging because it makes you realize <laughs> I'm talking about this, because all the articles are written from the left's perspective. So the things that we want are deemed bad. The things that they want are good, but that's what the press is saying all over yes. the country. But it really tells me I learned so much from that. Um, is that something that people could sign any, up for? Any, anybody can get on that. Um, the easiest way is really to, uh, Andy Blum runs that for us. And uh, as you note, it's a, it's a gathering of whatever is being said out in the media. And that right. is typically favorable to us. We're not packaging up, you know, some little happy gift for people. We're letting people see what's going on all over the country. And we do it. Uh, with a lot of targeted states as well. Uh, Andy Blom, uh, B-L-O-M, at Comcast.net uh, can put you on that list. Anybody watching, that's Andy Blom, B-L-O-M, at Comcast.net. Um, we all have our ETI email addresses, but his changed recently. So I'm going to go with the personal one that I know <laughs> rather than okay. the ETI. Well, it's really, it's really great. And we can post that yeah. also. Um, and so, and for it, things, it, by the way, Cleta, for things like the, the little, we'll do specialty newsletters when candidates get in these presidential races, Republican oh, okay. and Democrat. That's that's where that will get published. It's folks okay. on that list will see it first. Well, that's great. So if people want to have information about where candidates for president stand on election issues. This is where people will be able to go and find that out. So you sign up for that now. If people want to participate in any way with the election transparency initiative, is there a 
website uh, or something that people yes, can visit? electiontransparency.org. And um, we, we have things like our candidate questionnaires on there for the states that where that was done first time ever last cycle with you and many other partners getting those out. That wasn't just an ETI effort. We were just sort of the repository. And we're going to grow that in 23 and 24 so that candidates can be held accountable on the front end where they care most about your mm-hmm. opinion. And that's when they're trying to get your vote. Um, and uh, so we're going to grow that effort. That's at the website. We're also on Twitter and uh, at ETI. Uh, and my, my Twitter account is at Ken Cuccinelli. All you have to do is be able to spell Cuccinelli. <laughs> K-U-C-C, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You know, she's kidding on that. But, right. um, well, Ken, uh, it's wonderful to be a partner with you working on trying to save our elections because we actually think that's the only way we're going to save our country uh, from right. the radical left. So we appreciate this. Uh, so many of us appreciate your leadership and the fact that you're lending your considerable uh, background, experience and intelligence and intellect to this fight. So We appreciate all that you've done all these many years and so many different battles. We didn't even get to talk about uh, border security and all you did while you were at the Department of of Homeland Security and trying to protect our sovereignty and just all the things you've done over the years. You've just been a a great leader. So thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we hope everybody will sign up at uh, electiontransparency.org and... um, and and support the efforts of uh, what Ken is doing and Michael Bars and all the wonderful people uh, that he works with. So with that, we thank you for joining us. We hope that you will uh, share this episode of Who's Counting. And if you haven't subscribed, please do that. Uh, go to our website, whoscounting.us, and just download this and subscribe and see the rest of the materials that we have available for people to learn about how you can be involved in saving the elections where you live. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining Who's Counting with Cleta Mitchell, the podcast about America's elections. Please help us fight big tech censorship. Like and subscribe to this podcast and be sure to share it with your friends. You can become part of this election integrity movement by signing up to join the Election Integrity Network. Go to whoscounting.us. The Who's Counting podcast is produced by the Election Integrity Network.